as we continue this study, uh, we finished up talking about the sixth trumpet last week. We're going to look at the seventh trumpet <clears throat> starting this week, and we'll probably be in this, I don't know, a week or two. It's kind of a long, a lot of things happen. It's like the seventh trumpet, of course, the last of the seven. And uh, it kind of opens the way for a lot of other things. Kind of the rest of the things that happen in the book of Revelation happen, you know, kind of as part of the seventh trumpet, more or less, the, you know, bold judgments and all that. So, <clears throat> we'll look at that. Okay, back in uh, <clears throat> chapter 11, verse 14, the angel said, The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. If you remember back after the fourth trumpet, one of the angels made a statement said, uh, you know, woe to the inhabitants of the, of the earth because there's for the three trumpets that are yet to sound, which would be the fifth, sixth, and seventh. Now we're looking at the seventh one and uh, some of the terrible things that are going to happen during it. The seventh angel sounded. Uh, and now, <clears throat> remember, if you remember, from last week, one of the statements that was made was that in the days of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound... The mystery of God should be finished. We talked about some of the things about the mystery of God, what His plan and purpose is in creating the earth, uh, raising up you know sons and daughters and so forth, as a place where He would dwell with His people as an inheritance for His Son, and so on like that. So we're going to see some of the things that kind of define the, the mystery of God or uh Give us some insight into just exactly what that mystery is. And some of the things that are contained in it. Okay, dogs, no growling. That's her bone, by the way. The seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are becoming the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, this was prophesied back in Psalm 2. If you remember last week, we read, we read some of Psalm 2, where it, that's the, uh, well, let's just read it. I will declare the decree, the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thy inheritance, in the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So that declaration from the Father to the Son there in Psalm 2 is uh, what we see here. You know, this is another pronouncement of the fulfillment of that prophetic declaration back there in Psalm 2. So this, once again, illustrates that these things that we're looking at in Revelation, they're, they're all back there in the Scripture. Uh, even these things of the mystery of God that he had revealed to the prophets. They're here. Daniel also saw a vision of this. <clears throat> he says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. So these, uh, here in, in Revelation, this is what we're, this, these great voices in heaven proclaiming this at the sounding of the seventh trumpet is a declaration that those prophecies back there, those things that Daniel was one of the prophets that saw this, and there are some other references to this too back in the, in the other prophets, some of them, uh, that this is a fulfillment of that. And the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall reign forever and ever. So Daniel saw that. And also, you might remember, it's been a good while back, uh, when we were looking at some things about the book of Daniel. And this verse here is very interesting, and just since we're here, I'm going to just do a quick review on this. Um, Daniel saw what happened after Jesus' ascension. You remember the disciples were there when Jesus ascended into heaven into the clouds, and they saw him, you know, 
go up into heaven and disappear in the clouds. That was the part they saw from their point of view from earth watching him go. Daniel had centuries before had this vision. And this is what happened when Christ got to heaven. He came. He was presented to the, you know, came with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the Ancient of Days. They brought him near before him. And that began this where he receives his dominion and, and so on like that. So there's kind of a, a gap of time between this verse and, and this one. But these are both prophetic fulfillments. And this will, this will happen. This will be fulfilled uh, when Christ comes. And all of these things, every kingdom and nation and so on, on the earth are put under his dominion. Also, here's another thing. It's important that it clearly states that Christ will have dominion over the whole earth who originally was given dominion over the earth. It was Adam, right? But he lost that. He forfeited it because he sinned. Now, in you remember when God pronounced the, the punishment for Adam and Eve, uh, God cursed the ground because of Adam's sin. But you notice what God didn't take away. He did not take away the mandate for Adam to take dominion over the earth. Instead, God put the curse on the ground so that Adam would not be physically able to take dominion over the earth. The reason he, God didn't take that from Adam is because the second Adam, Christ, would a man, a physical man, would still one day take dominion over God's creation as God's representative, you know, in his creation. So we see, when we see this talking about Christ taking, receiving the dominion, it's the same dominion that was given to Adam, which he, you know, kind of forfeited and lost to Satan. And so on, uh, Christ, will, he will receive that. So, back to Revelation. Four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats, fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power, and has reigned. Now, this is interesting. And I guess we could probably kind of, I don't know, maybe <clears throat> investigate this out. But there's a statement here that says, talking about, you know, the Lord God Almighty, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned. So I get the sense here that, that it, at this point, God will pull out all the stops and he will exercise his mighty power that he has kept in restraint up until this time. I mean, you know, we a lot of times we hear questions about, well, you know, why does God allow so much evil in the world? Why does God do something about it? Well, I think we could answer that by saying that if God did not, restrain his own power to remedy all the evils in the world, then it would come to the destruction. <laughs> these destructive things, these are what's going to happen when <laughs> God decides to pull out all the stops and exercise his power and wrath and so forth. Anyway, let's read on. The nations were angry. <clears throat> Now, remember last uh, last time in the sixth seal, we talked about the uh, uh, the two witnesses that operated for three and a half years. They were able to, you know, breathe fire from their mouths and destroy their enemies. They were able to stop the rain. They were able to send plagues everywhere as often as they wanted to. That's one of the reasons why the nations were angry. If you remember when the, the two witnesses were killed, well, everybody in the world rejoiced. They had a big, you know, a new holiday, Dead Witnesses Day, and they sent presents to each other and all this kind of stuff. They were rejoicing because of, uh, you know, the two witnesses had been killed because of all the trouble that they caused everybody <coughs> above and beyond. Their message of that, you know, repent and worship God, the Creator, because judgment is coming. 
So they were angry, and now thy wrath, God's wrath has come in the time of the dead that they should be judged. And we'll see more details about that over in uh, chapter 20. And that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And look at this, this word destroy here. There's a uh, really better uh, definition, better word to use there would be like defile or corrupt. Because here I looked up the, the uh, definition of that. It uh, means to rot thoroughly or to ruin, uh, to decay and pervert or corrupt, that sort of thing. So it's not the kind of destruction like we see happening as a result of the you know, different trumpets and those kind of things happening. It's a defiling. And that's what Satan was trying to do trying to defile the earth so that God could not set up His holy kingdom with His holy people and so forth like that. And that, that's part of Satan's plan and policy now, and it, it will be. Uh, which is kind of one of the reasons why the whole conflict over there in the Middle East, he wants to occupy that with you know, pagan Gentiles to defile the land. <laughs> Back to Revelation verse 19. The temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. You know, as I was reading through this, I was thinking it would be interesting to, to go through the book of Revelation and just single out certain things. Like the times that the temple in heaven is mentioned. And and what's going on there? Because, you know, there's one time when something was about to happen and it says nobody could enter the temple until this certain thing, seal was opened or trumpet was blown or something. I don't remember exactly what it was now. And then there's other things going on around <laughs> in there. It'd be interesting to go through there and just kind of pick those out and, and do a study just on that. Now, I'm sure there's got to be something there. Some interesting things there. Probably significant things, but I, I, I don't know what all of those are. But anyway, at this point, the temple was open, which is really a rare thing because this is all the way in where you can see the Ark of His Testament. Now, one of the things we want to remember is that the temple on earth, that uh, or, well, the tabernacle that Moses built and the Ark of the Covenant in there and the Holy of Holies and and then the temple when it was built by Solomon and so on. Those were a model of the temple that exists in heaven. And uh, there's back in uh, Leviticus, I think, somewhere in there. Moses writes how that God showed him a vision of the temple in heaven. And all of the tabernacle and all the articles and the tables and the candlestick, and all of those things were copied after the articles in the temple in heaven. So it's a physical, literal temple in heaven. And it's open so that everybody, I guess, you know, there can see in there and so on. I'm sure there's a reason for the opening of the temple. Uh, the only time the earthly temple was ever opened, in fact, all the way into the ark, it was never opened. The veil was always, the curtain was always pulled there. The high priest would go in there once a year to pour out you know, the blood on the uh, Ark of the Covenant. But that was the only time. Uh, other times than that, nobody ever got to see in there. Until Christ's crucifixion, when the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. And it was, you know, opened in there. So, uh... Temple in heaven open and lightning and voices and thunderings and earthquake and great hail. These are things that are happening on, on the earth. There. Now, here's some interesting things. There appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. And upon her head was a crown of twelve stars. Let me catch up with my notes here. I missed something. Uh, Remember this, signs and wonders were for Israel. 
the uh, signs are you know designed to teach or inform the people something. The wonders are to produce an effect on the people, to have an impact on them for some particular reason or effect. And the miracles demonstrate God's supernatural power. So this vision of this woman that John saw, this represents Israel. Let's go back. Well, there's a kind of a pretty good drawing uh, of this. Uh, it says she's, you know, clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and has a crown of 12 stars and uh, the, the dragon, the great red dragon, kind of a Chinese looking dragon. Red dragon and he's to the third of the stars and so forth. Let's look at Joseph's dream. Back in, in the, Joseph told his brothers about this. Probably wasn't, you know, Joseph was a wise man. I think he learned his wisdom, a lot of it, like the rest of us. He came by it hard uh, for making bad decisions. One of the bad decisions Joseph made was telling his brothers about his dreams. He dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. Well, in his dream, uh, the, the sun represented, it represented his father, Jacob, and the moon represented his mother, Rebecca, Rachel. Rachel was Jacob's. Is Rachel, right? Yeah. Rebecca was Isaac's wife. Yeah. Yeah. Jacob and Rachel. <clears throat> so the moon represented his mother, Rachel. And uh, the 11 stars were the, his 11 brothers. We see in the, the 12 stars and her crown, those represent the 12 tribes of Israel. So uh, he says, they made obeisance to me. He, he dreamed that dream. Now, here, here's just a sideline thing, but I've got to throw this in. You remember that story of Joseph in Egypt when he was—he became the prime minister and you know, the famine, and he preserved the grain and all that. Finally, here came his brothers down there, and and so on. Well, when they came down there to Egypt, and Joseph recognized them, but they didn't recognize him, and he kind of played them along for a while. You remember the whole story? He didn't reveal it, reveal himself to him uh, all at once. It's very likely that Joseph remembered this dream. And his first dream was where they were out shocking wheat and they were shocking grain and the, and the other, the 11, uh, their shocks all bowed down to his sheaf or whatever they call them and so forth. It could very well be that uh, he remembered this dream. And could have had something to do with the reason why Joseph asked him, is your youngest brother still alive? Is Benjamin still alive? Well, yeah, he's back home with our father. The father wouldn't let him come. He you know, wouldn't let all the brothers come down here. And so, you know, Joseph said, okay, one of you is going to have to stay here as a prisoner, and y'all come back, and I want you to bring that, you bring the youngest son, or you don't get any more grain. <laughs> It's because when only ten brothers were there, Joseph was not going to reveal himself because he knew it's very likely that he remembered this and he knew, wait a minute, there's more to this story. Let's see what God is going to do. And sure enough, it came about that, that all eleven brothers were there when Joseph revealed himself who he was. And sure enough, they bowed down to him. They had to because he was the authority. And not only could he have sent them out of the country and said, y'all can just go starve to death. Uh, he could have just had them all killed as spies or whatever. So anyway, but Joseph had this dream. And here's where we get the, the, the symbolism of the, you know, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars and so forth. And that's what we, we see in this vision that John saw. And this is how we, uh, we know this vision he saw of the woman uh, with the 12 stars and the sun and moon and all that, that represents Israel. And, and other things we'll talk about too, the dragon and his attack on the woman and so forth. She being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Uh, and there appeared another wonder in heaven, behold a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Um, 
that his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Um, the, the woman, of course, represents Israel, 12 stars of the 12 tribes of Israel. And the child she gives birth to is Christ the Messiah, the Redeemer. Uh, now, there are some that believe this woman in John's vision represents Mary. You know, the Virgin Mary, Jesus' mother Mary. Um, okay, but not because it, it doesn't fit the rest of the things that, that, that happened with this vision with this woman and so forth like that. Uh, it, it can't it can't just specifically be referring to Mary. This this is a symbol of the nation of Israel, this woman. So and we could go back to Old Testament prophetic things and symbolism and see kind of the same, you know, same sort of characteristics back there. With similarities we could see. Um, it's Israel because it's God's chosen nation of kings and priests through whom he will redeem all of his created possession and also through whom the redeemer of mankind came into the world, Christ our Lord. So we know this is uh, talking about Israel. Satan also has a policy of evil against Israel and will always try to utterly destroy them in any way that he can. It's always been his plan ever since they came into existence and uh, it is now. And it always will be. Now, uh, the uh, I had to... I thought I had some notes on. Let's see. Oh yeah, I haven't got there yet. Let's just go ahead. Hmm. Yeah, okay. The dragon, we know that, rep represents uh, Satan uh, throughout Scripture. He's, taught, he's called the old serpent, or the, you know, the dragon and Satan and so forth. Not just him personally, but also his kingdom. We know that because it's divided into these seven ruling powers, the seven, you know, seven heads and so seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. The seven heads with the crowns uh, represents some kind of uh, uh, king or ruler. And the horns represent powers, like military powers or some kind of power to enforce their will. And this kind of goes along with the symbolism we saw back in Daniel and so forth. And it we'll see again in chapter 13 about the beast that you know rises up and this monstrous beast with, you know, leopards... Uh, body and bear's feet and lion's teeth and you know seven heads and ten horns and all these other things representing the uh, the, the kingdom of Satan and the human agents or agencies that he has under his control kind of as a confederation to do his will and trying to use them to destroy Israel and to grab the you know, the earth, and uh, keep it for his own. Now, uh, one of the things we should always remember is that no matter what Satan's forces are allowed to do, or how far his power seems to extend, God sets the boundary limits within which the forces of evil may operate. You know, Satan's kingdom has to incorporate human forces to provide you know, the physical element necessary for him to uh, perform his occupation and uh, operations in the world, and you know, earth and heaven. Because, I mean, Satan is a, basically a spirit. His angels are spirits. We know that the demonic forces, they have to try to inhabit some human body or some kind of body. It could be an animal... Uh, you know, sometimes an object or a place, but uh, they have to have humans on their side to, to help them do their bidding as well. Uh, so, 
let's look at this. Wait a minute. I got something out of sync here. I missed something. Yeah. Oh, there it is. I had to. Wasn't looking for that. Here's something that uh, I can't really tell you exactly what this is. Or what's going on here? It says his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast into the earth. Now, pretty much commonly, we have uh, understood, we've heard, we've read that uh, this is talking about this third part of the stars of heaven. He drew the third part and did cast into the earth. This is where we get the pretty much widely accepted belief that one-third of the angels followed Satan in his rebellion and fell with him and became his, you know, fallen angels. Um, it could be the case, but, you know, we're seeing a lot of symbolic things going on here. But could there be other possible explanations to this? Could this phrase, these stars of heaven, could this mean something else? What if it's not, what, what if this is not talking about Satan drawing a third of the angels with him and they fell with him? I mean, we know a lot of them did. A lot of the angels fell with him. We know that. That's where the fallen angels came from. That's where those, you know, demonic spirits and so forth, I, that's, you know, pretty clear. That's where they came from. But I don't know that we can get that from here. I think I'm throwing out the question, are we, are we reading something in here that's not there? And there's a reason why I'm asking this question. Um, does, you know, if we look at the symbolism we're seeing here, maybe we shouldn't just naturally assume that the stars refer to angels. I think a lot of times we want to, anytime we see stars, the word stars, the term, you know, used in the scripture, and we can't really place it, we want to turn them into angels, mainly because of the verse in Job 38, 7, which says, you know, the, uh, all the morning, the, the uh, sons of God shouted for joy, and the morning stars sang together. And it's talking about the creation and so forth. Um, so, if... Some other possible explanations of this uh, could be that, all right, we're talking about stars of heaven. Now, up here, this vision of this woman has a crown of 12 stars. And we know what the 12 stars represent. They represent the 12 tribes of Israel. So if, the, if in, within this context, in this subject that we're talking about, this vision of this woman and the dragon and the conflict between them two and the attack and so forth like that, if within this context the stars represent the 12 tribes of Israel, could it be that the third part of the stars of heaven also in some way represent members of the believing remnant of Israel, uh, the saints, the members of the tribes of Israel, something like that. that. Here in this vision, then we should be cautious about just taking this part of this verse right here and turning it into a belief that, well, this is the, where we find that Satan drew the third part of the angels, God's angels, and they became the fallen angels with him. I think it's kind of one of those cases we may be reading something in here that's, that may not be there. So anyway, I'm not trying to just be disputatious or argumentative. I'm trying to say, let's just take a, you know, there may be an alternate way to look at this than the way we traditionally have third part of the stars of heaven and cast them to earth. So he threw them down to the earth to do that. Well, and 
it could be, and I was thinking, I've been thinking about this for, you know, uh, a good while now, trying to think of, how, you know, what, what exactly, I mean, is it talking about literally a third of the stars of heaven? I mean, that's a lot of stars. I don't know how that Satan could have that kind of power over God's creation. I mean, the stars are innumerable. Um, if it was only one-third of the visible stars that we can see, that would be a tremendous amount of stars. If he could scoop up one-third of the stars that you can see and cast them to the earth, I don't know how the earth could physically withstand that. I mean, if this is a literal, physical, he scooped up the stars and cast them to the earth, I don't know how the earth could withstand it. You know, uh, the atmosphere couldn't absorb that much you know, stars from heaven. It would just burn. It would just, the whole atmosphere would just ignite, you know. So, now, it could be. It could be that. It could be literally him just the physical stars that we see and casting them to heaven because there are a number of scriptures. Uh, and I, uh, I think I wrote them down in my notes at home and forgot to put them in, the, in these notes. Uh, yeah, I don't see them there, so... But there are, there are a number of scriptures that talk about the, you know, and we've seen them in this prophecy study, the stars of heaven falling to the earth and so on like that. So it could just literally be what we find here. So well, why, are we referencing, why are we referencing back to here? I mean, uh, this is, is this a future thing that he's looking at or a past thing that he's looking at? Um, Okay, and uh, all right. Is he it's seeing, kind is of. He seeing it, okay, it's past, kind past of. Uh, future, future. All right, here's the. <clears throat> this is kind of who, and this is the part that's talking about Israel being the, you know, the vehicle through which the Redeemer came. So this is. I think this is literally a reference to Christ's birth because, you know, the Redeemer came through Israel. So, you know, that was then. Uh, so is this the reference to Israel at the birth of Israel? No, I think it's the, it's, this is a reference to uh, Christ's birth. There, but I'm forward in, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, you know, she was she travailed in pain to be birthed, and she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and his throne. So, I mean, that's clear. We know exactly who that's talking about. That's talking about Christ, his birth, who he was, which, I mean, this part hasn't happened yet, but it will. But this part of the prophecy has happened because he was... Caught up unto God, you know, and to his throne. So uh, that the part where the, the dragon was to eat the child and he threw a third of the stars to the earth, is that uh, right after the birth of Christ? Or? Yeah, as far as when, when exactly are we? Uh, yeah, how much are we jumping back and forth here? You yeah. know, is this, yeah, yeah is, is, is this in kind of a, chronological order here and uh, that's that's hard to say I I kind of see well really um, as far as Satan trying to devour her child as soon as it was born I mean we know that happened because uh, through Herod through King Herod I mean we know about the massacre of the the children in uh, Bethlehem. So, uh, you know, he, uh, he literally and physically tried to destroy Christ soon after he was born. Well, let's tell you, so, drew the third part of the stars. That's yeah. because she brought forth the son. Not, not as she was doing it, it was because she did. Yeah. In the past. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Because so, of the history of it, therefore, his yeah. 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 So yeah, I guess that's 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 a good point. But look at this phrase as you know, it's in the chronological order because that's kind of how we're 
how we're seeing this. So yeah, but anyway, I you know, I don't know. I can't really, I can't really nail this down exactly what that means. <laughs> I, you know, uh, so I'm gonna throw out some. Well, if you substitute uh, the guy who stood before Israel, which is ready to be delivered and to devour Jesus, yeah, as soon as he was born. Yeah, yeah. If you kind of substitute those words in there, yeah. you might. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it would. That would, uh, it would read a little clearer. Of course, we know clear. that he was behind the area. Mm -hmm. create, but the third part of the stars of heaven, I don't... Yeah, I, I just... I can't place that. I just don't Unless know what that's... the stars of heaven are actually uh, people's nations or... Yeah, that's it's kind of what I'm thinking. I'm thinking if if they refer to people, and one of the reasons I, I'm trying to I'm trying to fit some category of Israel in there because one of the things God said to Abraham in the covenant promises was that your descendants would be as many as the stars of heaven. So similar phrase. I'm trying to. Find some category there where that fits, and I can't find one. So I'm not going to shoehorn it in somewhere where it doesn't belong. I'm not going to read something in there that's not there. So we'll just have to, you know, go on and figure that well, down the road we'll. Yeah, because right above it, it says he's a great dragon. He has seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns. So he's yeah. He has seven seven nations. Right, I seven seven nations and kings and so on. Yeah. <laughs> Under his, you know, under his power, and uh, and we know that under the the Antichrist, the Beast, and Daniel's prophecies about that, he talks about how that there's um, ten horns, and then one horn comes up in the middle and displaces three of the horns, and so that there ends up with eight horns, and that one horn has a great mouth, you know, speaking blasphemies and all those kind of things. So uh, this. Seven uh, nations, kings, and so forth are going to be that end time antichrist empire that he is going to use to, uh, you know, uh, support him and so forth. And uh, these nations are named. We could go to Psalm 83 and also uh, I think Ezekiel 38 and 39 names the same, about 10 nations. That surround Israel today. They're all Islamic nations. So anyway, uh, she brought forth a man child and so forth. Her child was caught up unto God to his, his throne. We know that refers to Christ, to his ascension. No, no doubt about that. You know, it's kind of funny. I'm thinking that when John wrote this to the people in the seven churches of Asia, things like the third part of the stars of heaven and so on, they probably knew exactly what that meant. And something has been lost. There's something, some information we don't have, we just don't know. So it's 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 funny to me that in these things, some of it is really clear and really easy to understand. We know exactly what it's talking about. And other things like this, we really don't have a clue. And it's, we're just missing something somewhere. I don't know. Maybe we'll find it down the road. So, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. So here's the same number of time period. This is the same description of the time period, a thousand two hundred and sixty days, uh, that the two witnesses would prophesy. Now we don't know if these two time periods exactly coincide, but I'm thinking they they probably pretty much do. And I'm thinking that most of these things we're seeing happen are happening in that last three and a half years. Well, they're that you know, great tribulation they talk about, or time of Jacob's trouble. Um, well, that's the remnant, isn't it? This is the remnant. Yeah, this is the believing remnant of Israel that are going to, you know, flee into the wilderness and they've got a place God has prepared for them that he would feed them there for three and a half years. I'm thinking that last half of the 
you know, seven year tribulation. Uh, this, this is kind of what Matthew, uh, I mean, uh, Jesus was talking about in Matthew 24 when he told them, he said, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. And, you know, we've, we've read that. We've covered that. We know what that's talking about. That Antichrist setting up his image in the temple and demanding that he be worshipped. Uh, and Jesus said, Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. And he, you know, just, he said, Don't go into your house to get your clothes. Don't go to get anything. Just run. Just get out of town. Run. Flee to the mountains. He said, Because then is going to be great tribulation such as has never been before or will be ever again. That's kind of why I'm thinking a lot of these trumpets and all of these judgment things that we're seeing, these are going to, they're, they're going to come about uh, as a direct result of the abomination of desolation when Satan's man sets himself up in God's temple to be worshipped and demands that the whole world worship him. That's going to be it. Bang. The trumpets are going to blow and so on and the, you know, Day of Wrath is going to be there, and it's going to happen. But anyway, this is one of the reasons uh, Jesus told them to flee to the mountains and run, because uh, the, see, the remnant, the believing remnant, because they are the believing remnant, they will have been studying the scriptures, figuring out what's going on, and they're going to know, hey, uh, there's going to be a point where we're going to have to run to the hills and get out of here, and they're going to know because there, you know, plenty of prophetic scriptures. God has a place prepared for them. Plus, uh, I think the two witnesses, and there are probably going to be other prophets uh, in there, the people kind of with the uh, prophetic office that are going to know what to do and tell the remnant, you know, what to do, uh, where they're going to go. <clears throat> don't really know. I didn't really have a. Well, I guess I kind of do. You know, here's Jordan over here. And uh, I'm not sure where Petra is. A lot of people think Petra is one of the, you know, sanctuary cities of Israel. Uh, it could be. I don't, I don't know if it is or not. But somewhere in the wilderness, somewhere, God has a place prepared. And when they leave... You know, Jerusalem up in here, uh, Jerusalem, you know, here, and, and wherever they are, the remnant is in Israel, when they flee from the cities and flee out of the wilderness, now there's one kind of a school of thought, and it, it has pretty good merit, that there's more than one place, that there's be several places of sanctuary for the believing remnant to go. And it very well could be. I tend to think there's one place, and that's where they're going to go. Somewhere out in the wilderness, probably down in the desert somewhere, and, and God will preserve them there. He will provide them water, and I believe it's probably going to be similar to uh, what he did with the Israelites when they came out of Egypt. They came out there, you know, Moses struck the rock and water came out, all the water they needed. Uh, God brought manna from heaven, Every night, they went out there in the morning, manna was all over the ground, all they had to do was pick it and eat it. They could cook it, they could eat it raw, they could, several ways they could eat it. I think he's going to do that kind of thing for the remnant of Israel. He's going to divinely provide for them and preserve them out in the wilderness, somewhere there. And uh, I think, yeah, here you go. I wouldn't argue with anybody, it's kind of me, but I think that when Christ returns to set up his kingdom after all that tribulation is over and all that. When he returns to set up his kingdom, where, wherever, if it's you know in the wilderness down in here somewhere, wherever that believing remnant it is, remnant is, I think Christ is going to physically go and get them and lead them into the land. <laughs> and I, I didn't think about it now, I should have put the photograph in there. Y'all remember seeing the photographs we took of that crossing place, it's still there, you can go there today, that Jordan River crossing where, where Joshua and the Israelites crossed, in that same place, uh, that same place where John baptized Jesus, 
It was that same place where Elijah and Elisha crossed the Jordan River back and forth. That's a holy and a sacred place to Israel. And I think if if the remnant is wherever, if they're out here in the wilderness, wherever they are, it may very well be that Christ will go and get them and he'll lead them back into the land through that same place that uh, he did before. Because they're going to understand that all the way back at their beginning, that was the entry place for them into the land. That's the place Moses took them to, and that's the place where Joshua led them across. That was the place where that Jordan River, during the flood stage, God stopped the river, and the water just piled up in a heap, it said. And Israel, the 12 tribes, crossed over on dry land. At that crossing, and it has been a significant place ever since, and it still is today. So I believe that it could be that Christ may get his remnant of people and lead them back into the land, right through that same place. And uh, because they'll know what it means. They'll, they'll know what it means. It'll be a, a significant fulfillment of prophecy. So anyway, somewhere within walking, you know, distance, the uh, people, and if you remember the warning Jesus gave them when he said, you know, flee to the mountains, he said, pray that uh, your flight is not in the winter because there won't be anything to eat out there. And uh, he said, pray that it won't be on the Sabbath because you can only travel so far on the Sabbath and so on and pregnant women and all that. He said it would be tough. Uh, but somewhere out there, when they get to the place, God will provide for them a refuge in the wilderness. <clears throat> so, then John's continuing vision. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, notice something here. This is kind of back to our discussion on the stars of heaven and who they are. In talking about this war in heaven, Michael and his angels, and this is it also says, you know, Satan and his angels. They're not referred to as stars or fallen stars or anywhere. So if the, back there in that verse talking about he drew a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth, if that was referring to angels, then why aren't they called angels? They're called angels here. Why aren't they called angels back there? So I don't know. And there may be a reason, but just throwing that out here. But here we find this war, and here's what... They should have put the marker board out here. But here's what I wonder. If when we see this war in heaven, and this is this is a you know specific kind of for that time, and here talking about our uh, uh, timeline of things, I think now we're in things that are going to happen. We're not talking about things that happened in the past. We're talking about you know things that are going to happen. Uh, when the Antichrist on earth makes his push to set himself up in the temple to be worshipped, his push to take over the earth. I wonder if it's at this that same time that Satan gathers his evil forces, his angels, and tries to force his way into the very heaven of heavens where God's throne is. So that it's kind of a two-pronged uh, attack. He makes the grab for the earth, and he makes the grab for heaven at the same time. It's his last greatest effort and he's throwing everything he has into it and he's making the push once and for all to make his claim and take what he believes should be rightfully his to fulfill those five I wills that he said you know I'll ascend above the stars of heaven and, and uh, set my throne you know I'll be like the most high and all those other things uh, but 
as we see, it doesn't work. He is defeated. Michael and his angels defeat Satan and his forces in some battle in the heavenly places. And they are cast out into the earth as a result of something that happens in that war. They lose the uh, rights they have to operate in the, up in the heavenly places. No longer are no longer is Satan called the prince of the power of the air. He's not up there anymore. He can't you know fly around up there and do whatever he wants. He's cast into the earth and restricted there. So they're going to lose a lot of what they had. Whatever you know uh, rights territory will be revoked when they lose that territory. Um, you know, in war, an occupier can do pretty much whatever they want in the territory they occupy, uh, even if it doesn't belong to them. So that, that's what Satan has been doing as the god of this world. If you remember from 2 Corinthians, I think, 11, 14, Paul calls him that. I don't know, maybe it's 24. Anyway, uh, he's been able to operate in the world as an invader, as an occupier, even though he doesn't own it and he doesn't have rights to it. It's kind of like the, the Nazis, you know, the Germans. Wherever they went, they occupied a country. They could do whatever they wanted to because they had tanks and machine guns and airplanes and other people didn't. So they could do what they wanted to because they were occupiers. Well, that's the way Satan is now in the heavenly places except for God's heaven and in the earth. Um, but... Because he took it by force, he had no right to do that. He is uh, you know, now seeing in these verses, his kingdom is beginning to crumble. And this will be a significant blow to the devil's kingdom when he loses his, this war uh, against Michael and his angels. Michael, apparently being the chief principality that guards over the nation of Israel. Now I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Now, I'm not going to go into a whole big long thing here, but this is another one of those Scriptures that has kind of become folklore, and we it, we have kind of ex accepted the belief that Satan is up there standing before God, accusing all of us, bringing up all of our stuff we've done wrong. And that's that's not what's going on here. Number one, remember who we're talking about. We're talking about the nation of Israel. Uh, so I know that I'm sure. You've probably heard preachers, I have too. I may have even been guilty of it myself. I don't know. And saying, you know, Satan is an accuser of our brethren. He's accusing us before God and so on. Well, he's really not. This is kind of more specific to the context we see here. Um, let me find my, Nathan's, my, my notes here. Satan is described here as the accuser. Uh, but this refers to the believing remnant of Israel. Because they're the subject group being discussed here. No reason to accuse unbelievers of anything because they're guilty already. It doesn't matter what they're accused of. It doesn't matter. Also, remember that Satan is the father of lies. And as such, his accusations against the remnant of Israel are most likely all, or at least for the most part, false accusations. Always remember that falsely accusing others is the devil's work, even if you're a pastor and deacon. So, <laughs> not that any of us have ever experienced that. But Satan is the accuser. But remember this: that doesn't mean that those accusations are true and accurate. If he's a liar, most of his accusations are probably false. There are two examples in the scripture we have of Satan accusing people, and both times the accusations were false. One is in Job, where you know it says the the 
sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And I know here again, people want to turn those sons of God into angels. It's not. Those are men. Those are men who worship God. Because in those days, they would come together and make sacrifices and worship God. So those were, those were sons of God. Men, those were men. And Job was one of those. Satan came in there and uh, I assume uh, God could see him. Those men apparently could not. And uh, he accused Job. He accused him, God, the only reason he serves you is because you've blessed him. You physically blessed him. You remove your hand away from him and he'll curse you to your face. That was a false accusation Satan made against Job. And that proved to be false because Job's integrity never failed. The other one is over there in Zechariah chapter 3 verse 1. I think it is, yeah. Where uh, he makes an accusation against Joshua the high priest under Zerubbabel. Among that group that came back from Babylonian captivity to Israel to rebuild the, you know, the city of Jerusalem and the temple and all that. So uh, at both those times, we, we find that Satan's accusations were false. And uh, so anyway, just because he does accuse doesn't mean those are uh, uh, accurate. Now, how exactly Satan accuses people before God day and night is difficult to determine. Uh, it's it's hard to see that Satan would have access before God and before His throne to go in there and accuse. I, I, there, there must be some other way. I don't I don't see that. I don't see any justification to to believe that Satan would have access to God's throne in heaven. I, I wouldn't. I've, no, I, I, anyway. Uh, so there must be some other means or whatever, but anyway, he does. So the accusations, even if true, only applies to those under Israel's program because it would only work under the covenant system, under the if-then relationship Israel had with God. And that they had before, before the dispensation of grace, and that they will have again when their prophetic program once again starts in the seven-year tribulation. They'll be back under the covenants. They're going to be back under that if-then system, where if you listen to my voice and keep my commandments, I'll bless you. If you don't, then these curses will come, and so on. Let's see where we are. If we... Uh, I don't know if I want to... You know, let's see. Yeah, we'll finish this subject and then I think we'll we'll stop because I don't want to rush through and make myself a scratches on my, on my ink list. I don't have my Sharpie markers. Yeah, I do. I do. You're a real nerd if you carry a Sharpie <laughs> marker with you. Uh, Alright, let's finish this point. The accusations against the brethren uh, wouldn't have any bearing now anyway in the dispensation of grace, whether they were true or false. They would have no grounds because at this time, under the working of God's grace, God is not imputing our trespasses unto us. In other words, God's not directly punishing people for their sins. Um, because of the working of His grace and mercy, Everyone has the opportunity to repent and you know accept Christ and so on. The reason that in the all this prophetic stuff in these end times we see all of these judgments coming down is because the dispensation of grace has ended. And they're back they're back the world is back under the covenants. That's God's relationship with the world at that time. And so when all of this stuff starts, 
God will once again be in the position where he is imputing their trespasses unto them. You know, <laughs> when they do something, bam, he can judge them right then and there. And that's a lot of what we see going on here. So uh, the accusations against the brethren, this shows us that this is under Israel's program and the working of the covenant system and so on. So under that, God will impute people's sins against them, except you know for the believers who have received forgiveness in Christ. Hence the increasing series of judgments during that time. Okay, um, we're just going to, oh, we got that one on the PowerPoint. Verse 11, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, love not their lives unto the death. I want to I talk about that. We'll just pick up right there next time and continue through this because there's more here than I want. I don't want to try to rush through this uh, to finish it tonight. We'll just uh, pick up there next time. So, all right. Some interesting things, a lot of confusing things. We're throwing out a lot of questions here. And if there's nothing else that we gain from this hatchet job of going through this book of Revelation, we've come up with a lot of questions for us all to keep in our minds. And, I, and you know, I have confidence that we'll, uh, over time, we'll find answers to these questions. <laughs> you know, maybe a year down the road, two years, be reading something totally unrelated that's what that meant right there. And uh, it sure happens. So anyway, all right, anybody got anything to add or comments or questions? Well, for all this, even though it's confusing, it's just that you just have to have faith in the Word of God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, it's good to at least be familiar with it at, as, at least as much as we can understand and, and get. But uh, I think, too, it's kind of important to come to grips with the fact that, look, there's a lot of this we just don't know. And where, where we don't know, we just we don't know. We go and move on and not try to contrive some kind of explanation just because We've got too much pride to say, well, I don't know what this means, <laughs> you know, or whatever. So anyway. That's what Martin Davis said this morning. Welcome to the land of I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, he talks about the mystery of God. I mean, I don't think God's going to reveal everything yeah. to us. I, I think there's a lot of things he hasn't revealed. There's a lot of things he's kept secret. He's going to reveal to them in that time, you know. Uh, I, I think he will. I, uh, I think it will be pretty clear to them. So, yeah, and a lot of things we just, you know, we just don't know. But, you know, we have to remember, too, that, I mean, we're in a completely different culture than the people this was written to. And we have a completely different education, totally different background, different history, Different worldview, and I mean, we're, you know, looking at this down through a long tunnel of time when a lot of information has been lost and just, you know, so, I mean, you know, go 2,000 years in the future and try to describe our culture to people living then. It'd be, you know, it'd be terrible. It'd be, it'd be tough to do. So. We'll just go 50 years back and yeah. try to explain it to the kids. Nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> they don't understand. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, you, yeah, you take a... Uh, just look at the kids, the teenagers and the right. young students. They have a whole different set of problems <coughs> they're dealing with. Yeah. Not like what we yeah. do. Yeah. 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 Their, their uh, world is a lot bigger because of communication. <coughs> You know, I mean, we we could at least get away from people. It was kids we didn't like at school or whatever, bullies or whatever. We could at least, you know, we had to be around them at school. We left school. We didn't have to be around them, you know. But it's not that way now. There's the electronic stuff in there. Like follow you wherever you go. Follow you wherever you go. Back pocket. Yes. <laughs> All right, let's pray.